Chapter 15, Where You Are Now, Part 3. Detachment is experiencing your feelings without allowing your feelings to control you. Instead of just reacting, with detachment you are free to choose how you will act. You use thinking and feeling together, so you can make smart choices. Point within a circle. All Masons are introduced during their ritual lectures to the Masonic symbol of the point within a circle and instructed in its illusion. The most interesting thing to me during my own such introduction was that the figure representing this symbol contained not only a point within a circle, but also two straight vertical lines touching the sides of the circle. It was explained during the ensuing lecture that these lines represented the two holy saints John, namely John the Baptist, and John the Evangelist. This struck me as peculiar to say the least and I have been trying to figure out this peculiarity ever since. In the course of my inquiry I found several explanations, including one which pointed out that the feasts of the two St. John's are separated by six months' time, and that the symbol of the point within a circle is a sort of miniature ornery showing the path of the earth about the sun, with the feasts designating winter and summer solstices. Another explanation likened the circle to an astronomical or astrological diagram, complete with astrological symbols arranged about the circle circumference, and which held that the vertical lines were representative of the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. Yet another variation of the explanation of the point within a circle also identified the vertical lines as signifying the two saints John, but expounded upon the significance of the VSL in the symbol and offered an exhaustive discussion of chapters and verses within the Bible attributed to St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist all of which alluded to the point within a circle representing God and man, respectively. A further version was discovered which ignored the vertical lines, but which asserted that the point within a circle was the monad, and represented God. These various explanations, though they were all plausible in the world of Masonic symbolism, did not satisfy my curiosity. I began to consider that the figure representing the point within a circle is reminiscent of a drawing which one find in a textbook illustrating some principle of geometry. We are all acquainted with the Masonic symbol of the 47th proposition of Euclid. I began to wonder if the point within a circle might be a similar construction. It was at about this time that through further reading I discovered what was described as a closely held secret of ancient craft masons. Namely that if one is to draw a circle and then draw a further line across that circle through its center point, marking its diameter, a right triangle can be simply yet consistently constructed. The technique involved is to draw a line starting at the point where the line through the circle's center intersects the circle circumference, and to extend that line until it touches the circle at any point on its circumference. The line is then continued from the point of intersection with the circumference to the point at which the center line intersects the circle on the opposite side of the circle's diameter and is further continued to the start. The end result is that a right triangle is constructed regardless of the point on the circle's circumference selected. Try it yourself. It works very nicely. This method for the construction of a right angle is presented as Theorem 12. In Book 3 of Euclid's Elements, an angle inscribed in a semicircle is a right angle. Euclid wrote, let angle ABC be inscribed in the semicircle ABC. That is, let AC be a diameter and let the vertex be lie on the circumference. Then angle ABC is a right angle. Although presented in Euclid's Elements and provided with a proof formulated by Euclid, it was the Greek philosopher, astronomer, and mathematician Thales of Miletus, Ka. 624 BC Ka. 546 BC, who is credited with the first publication of this theorem. Naturally, as a trade secret this technique would have proven extremely valuable to the ancient craft masons, and could be used among other things, to check the squares of workmen to ensure that they were true. It is also probable that the development of scientific surveying and navigating instruments such as the astrolabe made use of this, or a similar theorem in their construction and as their operating principle. When reading this I recalled the symbol of the point within a circle, and began to wonder if the point within a circle might actually be a diagram which was intended to be used as a proof of Thales' theorem. I decided to research the matter and in the course of doing so, discovered an excerpt from a Masonic handbook, which, regarding the point within a circle, stated, ritualistically, this is a symbol of control of conduct. 
a standard of right living. The symbol has an extreme antiquity. Early Egyptian monuments are carved with the Alpha and the Omega or symbol of God in the center of a circle embroidered by two upright parallel perpendicular serpents representing the power and wisdom of the Creator. The symbol apparently came into masonry from an operative practice, known to but a few master workmen on cathedrals and great buildings. Any schoolboy knows it now. Put a dot on a circle anywhere. Draw a straight line across the circle through its center. Connect the dot with the points at which the line through the center cuts the circle. The result is a perfect square. This was the operative master's great secret, knowing how to try the square it was by this that he tested the working tools of the fellows of the craft. Did he do so often enough, it was impossible either for their tools or their work to materially err. I nearly considered the matter settled, and was convinced that I had drawn the correct conclusion thinking that the point within a circle was a clue to the geometric construction by which Thales' theorem could be derived. With further reflection I decided to confirm this by looking at the published proof offered by Euclid. I was surprised to discover that the proof of the theorem did not involve the construction of parallel tangent lines at all but rather relied upon the construction of a simple radius to the vertex producing the right angle. Further investigation revealed that over the centuries there have been numerous other proofs of the theorem developed, all different from that of Euclid, but none of them employing two parallel tangent lines. I quickly began to suspect that Thales' theorem was not actually related to the point within a circle, but rather that the point within a circle was associated with a different geometric construction. I combed geometry textbooks, Masonic encyclopedias, and the internet searching for a geometric figure which was constructed using a circle, a point at the center of the circle, and two parallel tangent lines on that circle. What I discovered was a second method by which a right triangle could be constructed, using these very elements along with one additional straight line, which is also a tangent to the circle. I have reproduced this figure as described by my source below along with an explanation of how the figure is drawn. A B and C D are two parallel tangents to a circle having a center O A random tangent E F with point of contact G intersects A B at point H and C D at point I beginning with the center of the circle O A line is drawn connecting O with point H. The line is extended to connect point H to point I, and continued back to the center of the circle, point O. This construction produces a triangle in which angle hoi is 90 degree. A narrative description of this technique is that given a circle with two parallel tangents, and a third tangent drawn randomly to the circle which intersects both of the two parallel tangents, a right angle may be constructed by connecting the center point of the circle to the points at which the tangents intersect. The proof of this construction is similar to that used for Hale's theorem and requires construction of a segment from the circle center O to the tangent point G. It is. I believe quite amazing that the elements of this construction so neatly utilize the framework contained within the Masonic symbol of a point within a circle. This discovery however leads to other questions. For example, why was this particular method for the construction of a right triangle used as a craft symbol, when a simpler method, Thales' theorem, existed, and was chronicled by Euclid? If this construction is indeed the intended functional use of the point within a circle symbol, it is probably of some importance to the craft. Yet this construction as a geometric function is fairly obscure and is not considered by Euclid as a theorem or proposition, although several of Euclid's propositions are used to establish the proof. Answers to these questions remain to be discovered, and I intend to find great entertainment in further exploration. A friend of mine once said most of what I know I learned while looking up the answer to something else. The truth of that humorous comment is rarely more evident than when examining the ancient symbols of Freemasonry. Unhealthy and healthy detachment. There are two different phenomena that take place when we relate to unwanted reality. Unhealthy and healthy detachment. Unhealthy detachment manifests in the phenomenon of dissociation withdrawal from reality in the face of a traumatic or stressful situation. This can range from mild detachment from one's surroundings as in daydreaming to extreme detachment even from one's own physiological and emotional reality. This defensive reaction is a coping mechanism and in that sense it does show strength, as it is an attempt to protect one's self. However it's unhealthy when it becomes a pervasive reaction that comes up in unwanted life situations and this turns it into a severe psychological disorder such as PTSD. A completely different kind of detachment takes place when one takes a stand toward what's happening and says this is wrong. I won't do this. This is boring. Or this is bad for me. 
In the second case one is detached from reality not in order to escape from it but rather in order to orient oneself to have a true relationship towards it. In the first case the person is beset by fear and withdraws even from his own personhood. In the second case the person shows strength and becomes a conduit for positive change. The irony in healthy detachment is that by detaching from what is wrong one becomes more connected on the level of creating a meaningful relationship. Thus if I'm not afraid to admit my wrongdoing and apologize for it or call someone on his hurtful words and express this. I will detach myself from what's wrong in the situation and become more strongly connected to what's meaningful about the relationship with this person. Detachment Philosophy. The lotus symbolizes non-attachment in some religions in Asia owing to its ability to soar over the muddy waters and produce an immaculate flower. Detachment, also expressed as non-attachment, is a state in which a person overcomes his or her attachment to desire for things people or concepts of the world and thus attains a heightened perspective. It is considered a wise virtue and is promoted in various Eastern religions, such as Taoism and Buddhism. Freedom and Boundaries Now the serpent was craftier than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say, You must not eat from any tree in the garden? God is big on giving man freedom and boundaries. Freedom to manage what he has entrusted to us boundaries to protect us from evil. The boundaries in the Garden of Eden were not set for the purpose of limiting Adam. Man got into trouble when he questioned those boundaries. God had provided everything he would need for life. He also entrusted man with responsibility to manage and work the garden. God gave him freedom in that responsibility. God knows we were made to express ourselves creatively through our work. Each of us must have freedom and boundaries in our work life. Whenever you are hired for a job, you must have the freedom to make certain decisions. You must have the authority to manage things within your area of expertise. You must also have limits within your area of responsibility. You need to know where those limits are and stay within them. Both freedom and boundaries are always under the umbrella of God's authority and our authorities at work. Jesus understood these boundaries when he was tempted for 40 days by the devil after being baptized. He was challenged by Satan to go outside his freedom and boundaries. Satan said that he had the power to turn a stone into bread. Jesus was hungry and easily could have justified using his power to feed himself. However, Jesus understood he could do nothing outside the boundaries of God's will for his life. It was God's will for Jesus to be tempted and to withstand the temptation. God was showing his son that man does not live on bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You and I are tempted every day to go beyond our God-ordained boundaries. Whether it is solving financial problems that have arisen through debt, making wrong decisions due to pressure, or manipulating someone in order to achieve our ends, it all represents rebellion toward God. Ask God to show you His freedom and boundaries for your life. These are meant to enhance your life, not hinder it.